welcome to our discussion of Oscar Me shows within our gates. I'm Susie Monaghan and I'm the executive director at the Smith Center for the Arts. And I assume that most of you know, the Smith is a 126 year old opera house in downtown Geneva. Uh, has been showing films for decades, if not a century. So uh, very appropriate that we have found this pandemic time to go uh, continue our film viewing with the virtual film club. And it's been going on for 10 months now. We've been getting together and watching and discussing films. And uh, the day has come that we are actually going to be able to reopen for in-person films. And the first one is gonna be April 2nd. So wanted to make sure you, you knew about that, but uh, today we are virtual yet again. And we're so excited to have teamed up with the Finger Lakes Film Trail. Wow. It's a brand new initiative, uh, the brainchild of Diana Reisman, who is on our chat today. Um, and it connects the innovation and early filmmaking in Auburn, Rochester, and Ithaca. So the Finger Lakes Film Trail uh, has brought forward this Race Films, Race Matters series of five films, early race films. And um, today we're gonna be discussing Oscar Me shows within our gates. And we have two uh, perfect folks to discuss this with us. And they are Becky Burdett, professor at uh, Hobart and William Smith Colleges, where she teaches is film, media theory, and advertising history, and Marilyn Jimenez, who is an emerita professor from Hobart and William Smith Colleges, where she taught from 1984 to 2020, just last year. She earned her PhD from Columbia University in English and Comparative Literature. Throughout her career, she taught Black film, Black popular culture, and other courses in the Africana Studies program, as well as film editing, cinematic effects in the media and society program. So welcome to Marilyn and to Becky. And I uh, just wanted to remind all of you who are on the discussion today to please mute yourselves and to put your questions in the chat. We'll be monitoring that. We'll give uh, Marilyn the, a, a great opportunity to give us some connection and background on this very important film. And then we will get to your questions as well. And, um, you know, we've got Barbara Lupak in this in this group to, today too. So Barbara, we, we are expecting uh, a question from you. So uh, I think without any further ado, Marilyn, can you take it away for us? Thank you. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. I am um, going to, do I have permission to share my screen? Yep. Okay, I would like to start with um, um, a um, conversation about um, what the film viewing experience does. Um, very uh, simply, um, I think we can all possibly remember um, a very specific experience that we may have had at the movies. Um, and those films uh, tend to transcend both genre and the uh, particular director who made the film. Um, Oscar Michaud's Within Our Gaze, I believe is such a film. Uh, it is a film that though it was lost for many years, now that it has been rediscovered, we can see a great uh, what an impact it could have had on its audience. Uh, in terms of Michelle's own oeuvre uh, or sort of set of films, um, this is uh, definitely his best. Um, it is his most passionate and um, it is um, perhaps the one that um, made, um, the, has made the most impact historically. Um, 
So like um, uh, Do the Right Thing, which a lot of African-Americans, particularly African-Americans, but many others as well, can certainly remember the first time that they saw Do the Right Thing, they saw it at the, at the movies. Uh, and we all know the story of, of Obama and Michelle Obama. Um, so it is Do the Right Thing, like Within Our Gates, is one of those films that transcends both its maker and its genre. Uh, and has sort of a, a, uh, an, an existence of its own at another level. Uh, what, so what I'd like to do first is place um, within our gates, within its uh, social historical moment, to try to understand what the impact would have been for the audiences who saw it when it was um, uh, presented for the first time. Then I'd like to talk a little bit about the narrative structure and style, just because it is a very different form that what we are into, that we are uh, normally accustomed to if we watch um, films in um, uh, Hollywood style films. Then we might see it as inept, um, as uh, amateurish, um, but he really truly was uh, uh, trying to articulate a different style because the, the, the spectacle First of all, he didn't have the uh, wherewithal to create the kinds of spectacle um, that um, that um, uh, Griffith had. Though I must say that the crowd scene is very well done. But in any case, he had a different um, a different orientation, and I call it a kind of didactic style, but also a style that is a signifying style. And I'm using that word in the way that. Um, uh, is applied to an African-American, very specific African-American style of expression. Um, it's very difficult to explain because it's very subtle and it, it, it does have African roots, but it's a form of um, indirect uh, criticism, indirect speech, um, which was um, particularly evolved, particularly among slaves because of course, they needed to be able to articulate um, what they felt, but they couldn't let white people know and white people could not be in on what was happening. So the term signifying comes from the story of the signifying monkey. Um, I'm not gonna go into that, but I'm going to try and explain what signifying is um, in Michelle's film. Now, this is based upon um, uh, Ronald Green's book, Straight Lit, the Cinema of Oscar Michel. And the way that, uh, that um, Michel signifies is that he uses elements of Griffith, very specific elements of Griffith's films um, and incorporates them into his films with a kind of sort of twinkle in the eye or see what I can do. Uh, kind of approach. Now, the title of Within Our Gates comes from a, a Griffith film, uh, which had been released in 1919, and it's called A Romance of Happy Valley. And it starred Lillian Gish uh, as a young woman who is courting a young man who wants to go to the city in order to make his way. And in uh, any case, a, a kind of uh, romance not particularly Griffith's, uh, one of the Griffith's best films, but nevertheless, here it comes where the title comes from. Harm not the stranger within your gates, lest you yourself be hurt. And, you know, a very, very pointed statement. Well, first of all, obviously undercutting the romanticism and, and hypocrisy of the Griffith film. And at the same time, putting it in and in, in, in making the statement that truly um, speaks to the importance of African-Americans to uh, American society. So that's a form of signifying. Another form, another thing that he did in terms of signifying is that of course, a, a, a lot of within our gates has uh, echoes of, of scenes in, in uh, Birth of the Nation, uh, but I'm not going to go over that um, just um, for the sake of time. 
right. <clears throat> now, the film is in the genre of race films, racial uplift films, and these were expected to, uh, to show African Americans in a positive light because, of course, in um, white films, they would see nothing but uh, the worst of stereotypes. At the same time, this was a period where a lot of um, racial um, uh, eugenics claims of, uh, of, of, of trying to sort of so-called scientific of, uh, proving that African Americans were an inferior race. So uh, uh, Michaud is answering to both of those. What he does then is um, ask it uh, is to show his main characters uh, always in um, surrounded by books, reading and writing. Uh, I, I put this together uh, uh, from different parts of the film. This is uh, montage, but I'd like to point out also the beginning of this, the inter uh, of the film, where he says that the opening of our drama, we find our characters in the north, where the prejudices and hatreds of the south do not exist. Though this does not prevent the occasional lynching of a Negro, um, uh, it's you know it's, it's a dig there, uh, particularly at the um, uh, some of the racial uplift uh, kinds of, of films that do not show that or do not um, acknowledge that there is forms of racism in the North. And I'll just show you quickly. So. We open up on um, uh, Sylvia, the, uh, 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 our heroine, and of course she is shown as you know surrounded by books and, uh, and reading, uh, as she's normally is. It's virtually every time she's introduced, she's at um, reading and, and so forth. Um, and then, of course, she visit, she be, uh, it becomes a teacher at some point. I'll talk about narrative chronology in a, later on. And again, she enters a world of uh, literacy. Uh, the the I, the notion that African Americans could read and write uh, was very important. Um, and that um, education that a lot of the uh, schools for African-Americans were created by African-Americans. They were supported by African-Americans. Um, so um, uh, it's important to show them in, in that light. So definitely this is within that um, race of film, a racial uplift, uh, ideology, um, and this is you know Sylvia's entrance. Um, uh, by the way, this uh, there's there's some stories about how uh, Michel made some of his films. So, for example, the the uh, the uh, uh, that uh, fur stuff the stole that she's wearing uh, in one film that he did that he. Uh, uh, he uh, had taken the uh, fur from a, a woman who was visiting, a white woman who was visiting, and um, uh, while the woman was busy doing something else, he filmed the scene uh, with the with the uh, with, with the stole, and then put it back on, you know, like on a rack wherever it's going. And then, of course, it's Dr. Vivian, the one who's going to uh, uh, become. Um, uh, uh, the uh, sort of the ideal uh, husband. Now, interestingly enough, Conrad is also presented, I didn't show his, uh, as reading and writing. So he is a member of that class, that middle class that represents the best of African, Amer uh, African American uh, society. But this is the first time we see him. And, and when we see him, we see him being incredibly violent. I don't know how many of you may have caught up to this scene. So he becomes impatient. He's waiting for uh, to see he's he's uh, uh, he has a, he's engaged to Sylvia but Alma is in love with him and I'm just uh, in a moment uh, 
and she has arranged for him to come to, uh, and Sylvia, um, you know, has, is, is, thinks she's about to marry him. And then we have this scene. Now, this infuriated people who it, it believed in racial uplift, other Blacks. This was one of the major criticisms of the film by many critics, many people in, these, in, in that sort of middle class um, uh, group. And it's not the first time, not the only time that um, Michelle shows violence uh, against Black women by Black males. He does that in Body and Soul as well. So it's something that he wants us to acknowledge. Not all of these middle-class so-called perfect Black males are in point of fact uh, perfect. Uh, also, it, yeah. Sorry, to, we, we do have a question from the, okay, sure. are you ready for one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, hold on. It is from Roman Vargas Garcia. And uh, they write, during the movie, I saw multiple newspaper articles and I'm wondering if those are actual articles from the time or were just fabricated. This is because I would see the use of original media as a tool to make subtle critiques towards society. I'm going to build on Roman's comment question mm -hmm. and say that I saw a quite large um, headline about Sinn Féin, which is the Irish Republican um, uh, Party. And that 1919 would have been about the time of the revolution in Ireland. And so I, I, I definitely noticed that. Thank you for reminding me of that, Roman. Um, you know, so I think it's a, it is a subtle background thing that would be really interesting to unpack. Yeah, that would be, that would be. I did, that's very interesting. That's something that even, that adds even more to, um, to I think to Michelle's um, ability to use these subtle moments, these subtle uh, elements to, to, to make a statement. And I, do, I uh, certainly would like to also, I'm gonna take a closer look. And this, is, this really adds to, I haven't also seen that by the way mentioned in um, a lot of the analyses of, the, of this film. So there's a hidden treasure there um, possible. So, uh, excellent. That's wonderful. I'm, I, I really, this, I think this just adds some more to to the uh, to the depth of what the film is trying to do. Uh, and I'm sure he used. Um, he would not. He probably used um, newspapers that were available to him. He didn't have. This was not like a. Product, big production Hollywood style where you could manufacture these things. Uh, as I said, he took whatever he could get. Um, so, um, uh, Marilyn? Yeah. Um, could I ask a question uh, from someone from the audience as well? Or would you like to continue first and then take a break after? Um, 
Well, I, let me finish this point okay. with this sure. scene because it's important for the rest of, and that I make this point. What happens then, if you think about it from the perspective of the audience that was watching the film at the time, they, they, uh, Michelle puts the audience in a very difficult position because they, they look at the scene, they don't, we don't know at this point that the white man that we see her with in her bedroom is her father. We will not find that out until obviously the end of the film. So for the entire rest of the film, which is the majority of the film, we as an audience have to make a choice about how we're thinking about Sylvia herself. Is she a, a woman uh, who has given herself to a white man in, in, because she is in a very compromised position? Or is, she, uh, is there an explanation for that? Is, is she innocent? We have to take sides. And when we watch the rest of the film, that is that becomes a, you know that's the way we we are forced to process that film. And that would have been a very powerful um, moment for, and and a risk um, that Michelle was taking uh, because now his we have we possibly the audience potentially has the same negative image of of uh, Sylvia. And um, let me see I'll. Uh, I'll try to go to the next, uh, in case you wanna, I, I don't know if the, uh, if the uh, uh, question was uh, related to that or in any way, or would you wanna take the question now? Uh, uh, no, well, I'll, you can uh, please okay. continue and then we'll bring it up a little bit later. All right, uh, so another thing that he does, uh, which is makes his uh, films very difficult to follow, but particularly within our gates, and part of it may have to do with the fact that this was reconstructed from a, a, a print that was found in Spain. Um, so we're not completely certain about the order, but where, whatever you do in terms of the narrative um, cohesiveness of the film, this scene does not fit in anywhere. Uh, this is the scene of Uncle Ned, or uh, he's called Uncle Ned, who is a preacher, but who is very, who, you know, uh, uh, very subservient to Blacks. This scene doesn't fit anywhere. Um, uh, Uncle Ned never appears again. So why is he there? These digressions are very typical of, uh, of Michelle. And then I'm going to show you the, the scene and I would like you to think about why might he have included this scene? And uh, Uncle Ned is a preacher. He has just delivered a, um, uh, um, a speech or a, a sermon.
Oops, sorry. So any any comments about this particular scene? Any ideas? Thoughts? Reactions? Um, I feel like it kind of it kind of emphasizes like the divisiveness of the time. And that's in a way that's kind of hypocritical. I don't I kind of it's like the bashing of uh, white people because of their anger. Maybe uh, they're trying to, um, I guess, accommodate for the anger that many black people had at the time. So maybe that's a way to reflect that. But then again, it also shows how divisive that can be. Reflecting mm -hmm. the anger back. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if I can say one thing, you know, one thing that I, I, I saw this after seeing, um, uh, I was putting together a, a conversation, one of the films we were talking about was I Am Not Your Negro, the James Baldwin documentary. Um, and <clears throat> one of the things, God, no, I can't remember um, uh, the film that he was scarred by. Um, it was a 1940s film. I'll, I'll find it and I'll put it into the comments. Um, but, but in that movie, Baldwin was scarred by... Um, an African American man who is just like in I am not a uh, native son who's um, uh, in this case actually was falsely accused of murdering um, just like in this in this film too a, uh, a white person um, and when he gets captured um, Baldwin talks about the stereotypical the big bug eyes and the it, it, almost exactly like in this film it, it's just amazing uh the the sort of um th that film's about 20 or 30 years later i just sort of found that this is a film that film was made by a white filmmaker this was made by an african-american filmmaker um and yet that's that imagery is exact that stereotypical imagery of that time is redundant and it's and it's something that almost i think it was that and i can't remember if it was rita hayworth or something in dance dance crazy dance um that just made him fall in love with films one because of the horror and the other one because he wanted to be that dancing woman i, I don't know if you've seen i am not your negro but it's an amazing um uh it's, it's just in a, the way cinema is used in there as a uh, as a narrative uh, of american culture the way you're talking about it right now with this film is um and and spike lee is 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 just it's sort of a bridging between the two. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Linda, Linda Robertson, you have a comment? Yeah, Marilyn, thank you. I'm, I'm enjoying this presentation very much. I was very struck by this sequence. Um, and I think the, the critique is very much James Baldwin's critique in his short stories. But it also is a very long standing history of uh, African American creatures being constructed as encouraging uh, African Americans to remain subservient. And two things struck me about this. One is that um, need to counteract the stereotypes of African-American men in minstrel and in vaudeville minstrel, uh, and in vaudeville shows. And it's really done brilliantly here where the creature has all the characteristics of the minstrel, even the minstrel who was um, a black person who had blacked up in acting for uh, white audiences their notion of this comedic degradation. And mm -hmm. then he just twists it. You know, he has this character fulfilling all of those uh, stereotypes. And then he walks out the door and says, you know, I've sold my heritage and, and I'm going to hell for it. It's, I think it's a stunning scene. And I, I can't think of another example where the effort was so clearly made to counteract and and 
insist upon the African-American voice ripping apart the stereotypes of minstrelsy that had been the African-American voice for so long because they weren't allowed their voice. And then right at that moment, uh, Ms. Show says, no, now we have our own voice. And you have to understand that man does what he does to earn a living. Mm -hmm. And he does it to earn a living in a highly charged situation mm -hmm. that has to do with religion and keeping mm -hmm. people down. And he hates himself for it. Mm -hmm. I thought it was just, I'm so glad you stopped us on that. I thought it was brilliant, just brilliant. Yeah, and add to that the fact that um, this is a representation of the accommodationist perspective of a Booker T. Washington. And Thank Michelle was a, was a Washingtonian. He believed in you know, enterprise, entrepreneurial, um, uh, as a way of, uh, um, of engagement um, with society, yet he's able to see what the extreme of, of you know, what that could, leads to. That's really interesting, Meryl. Yeah, and really it, I mean, it's, this is why sort of beyond that genre of racial uplift, which is so tied to Washingtonian. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Wow, great, thank you. There, it, it is an incredible moment. Yeah. It is. Um, Marilyn, would you yeah. be willing to take questions now? Yeah, sure. or, well, I have, do you, or do you want me to, I have one, I think one more slide. Okay. Oh, please, please go okay. ahead. Then. All right. Um, we haven't, uh, I, I, we need also to, I think, talk a little bit about um, film techniques. Um, the uh, film techniques available to Michelle or virtually to any uh, filmmaker at the time um, involve largely framing. And there's a great deal to be said about the way he frames characters um, and um, editing and particularly cross-cutting. Um, he doesn't, he, he does very few match actions. One of the interesting thing about the scene that we just saw that, that the moment that, that he leaves the room, Uncle Ned leaves the room is a match action, which is perfectly done. Uh, normally he doesn't really care about those very much and he doesn't do them very well. Uh, but it, it does point out that moment. What we have here, which is of course, um, something that um, uh, Griffith had perfected is cross cutting. And just to, uh, we know what this scene is, but the interesting thing is, for me at least, is the very graphic uh, rape scene, which, um, I mean, for its time, and the audience must have been horrified, um, I, even as we are today. But that cut in with the actual lynching, which we do not see. We only see that uh, crossbar, which to me, that is to me, not seeing those bodies, not seeing the actual lynching is more harrowing than, than actually having seen um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the lynching. And I'll point out the moment, you know, for example, that moment for me is so abstract but the potential for the symbolism of that uh, moment, that uh, close up. And I just, in this case, just uh, if you could pay attention to uh, uh, particularly the cross cutting. Um, And there's your cross cut to the lynching scene.
And of course, we had completely by this time forgotten the framing narrative, which is uh, um, uh, typical of Michelle as well. And I'll just take it to the Thank you. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Thank you. You can re release my screen now. Oh, you. okay. I mean, it's up to you, but yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, perfect. So uh, we'd like to take this time to open the floor to more questions and comments. Um, so please feel free to enter them into the chat. Um, we have one question that came up uh, from a little bit kind of toward the middle of your talk or actually toward the beginning of your talk when you were discussing the great migration. So this is from um, Tom Meek who asked, were there other migrations? Um, because he mentioned um, Daughters of the Dust and the fact that that also talked about another migration a few years or decades actually before the great migration. Yes, uh, actually, well, I, I'm, I would defer to the historians in the audience, but um, the Great Migration was not one particular moment. It, mm -hmm. it, it was from um, uh, almost from the uh, uh, from the at least the 1880s to through the uh, the 20s and 30s, and there were different kinds of migrations, if you will. There were different reasons that people left, African Americans left the South at different points. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it's called the Great Migration, but they, but they are stages to 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 that migration, and it was not all to the to the North. It was a lot of it was to the West, mm -hmm. um, and so there was a so there were. Um, um, uh, it, it's, it's uh, I didn't mean to sort of lump it together, but just for the sake of, and one of the things that's also interesting is, of course, is, is that at the end of the film, you know, Dr. Vivian um, makes this big speech about the fact that they are not migrants, that they are Americans, because this is also the period where you have the Irish, you have the Italians, and sort of making um, a, um, a point of becoming American citizens, being integrated into Americans, uh, into America as full citizens. Uh, and so there is that struggle as well. My, my understanding was one of the things for the migrations, I, I'd always read that was like, like late teens to like the mid thirties and mostly Chicago, but I'd heard that there were, as you said, other ripples, but, but the main thing was the migrations, the, the impetus for them was, uh, mostly economic opportunity because of the Jim Crow laws had had pretty much, um, you know, con continued to, I mean, there was just the opportunity by going elsewhere economically was um, the prospects were just much, much greater. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, absolutely. Right. Sorry. Um, absolutely. Because, I mean, there were not, it was also um, the fact that there were no, uh, uh, there's, been a, uh, there's a beautiful uh, intellectual history of this period uh, um, uh, uh, that uh, shows uh, that shows that process um, of psychologically why did, why did African Americans come to uh, to, uh, to the North? And you know, uh, African American women could first of all they were always um, in danger of being raped. And we can see in Michelle's film that rape doesn't just exist in the South, but in the North as well as a danger to women. They, they, the, the best they could be was a domestic um, in, in the South. So if they were looking for outlets on uh, other possibilities, it had to be, it, it would be in the North. Um, and, um, you know, there was, uh, 
laws, um, sunset laws that you, if you were African-American, you were found in the, in the street at your certain time of day, particularly a man, you could be hauled away to prison and, and, and then you would, you know, spend whatever length of time just working in the chain gang and things like that. Those, you know, the, the, that was, that was there. It was, uh, the South was an incredibly, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, dangerous place, um, just physically dangerous. I would just add one, two, like really good um, migration north, uh, other migration north to Chicago films would be, um, uh, of course, it's it's out there now. You can see it, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Mm -hmm. and, and another great one that probably most people don't know about because it was only made for, I think the uh, American Playhouse was, um, uh, the Killing Floor, which is all about the uh, butcher shops by Bill Duke um, in the in the mid nineteen eighties, um, it just got re released through some of the art house things. It's a, it's a great film about actually the migration and and moving uh, along with uh, the re release of Native Son um, is sort of really sort of uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the telling of, of of Chicago and that and that time period. Yeah, yeah, great. Those are great. Those are great references. Marilyn, would you be able to talk a little bit about the style of acting um, in in this film? Um, and if you have any, just if you have any comments on on the style of acting, you know, in silent film and in Michaud's work in general? Well, I can't really, I, I, I can't really talk so much about the acting because um, I, I can talk about framing and editing far more than uh, I'm not as nearly uh, attuned to the ways and to talk about acting. Um, it's um, it, in terms, of, I, you know, I, I showed you know the, the fact that he can um, uh, use cross cutting as effectively as a uh, Griffith. Uh, another thing that um, it has been pointed out by other critics is the framing. Mm -hmm. um, he tends to use um, a, a middle um, uh, 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 middle perspective on the on the characters, um, which is very uh, much of a documentary style. Um, there, there, there are articles on this on how uh, the distance that he keeps the camera from his uh, from his actors um, is very much in the documentary style as opposed to Griffith uses a lot more close-ups. I mean, he uses close-ups at very specific moments, um, but the, the film is not as emotionally over the top as some of Griffith's films are. Mm -hmm. um, in which the close-up is used, and I mean, this sort of bears upon the acting, and perhaps somebody else can, can you know, mm -hmm. take more of a, of, of a perspective on this, um, is that since he keeps his camera fairly distant from his characters, he wants people to think about the, uh, the film, and yes, he gives them the emotion, because after all, this is melodrama. This, it was the only format for any film at the time, um, but he was very. Um, but he wanted also that distance. Mm -hmm. No, I think I, I think that's actually what what I was asking. Even though mm -hmm. so you you read what I was in um, in a great way. You read what I was meant to say myself. Um, we have one uh, question from uh, and pardon me if I mispronounce your name, er Arielise Antonio. Yeah, Arielise. Arielise, hi. Um, would you would you like to ask your question? Um, yeah, I was just wondering that seeing that Oscar was like an exceptional African American director during this time, I was wondering if his films were like financed by white owned companies, since many race films at the time were produced by white owned film companies. Uh, no, not at this time. The silent films uh, he produced, he had his own company. He did not even, there were many other African-American filmmakers at the time, William Foster, the Noble Brothers and so forth. Um, he, he had uh, actually pitched uh, his first film to, to the Noble Brothers um, uh, and uh, he wanted to direct. 
and they didn't want him to direct because he'd never directed before. He had written lo loads of novels, but he had never directed. And he said, I'm not, I'm going to direct. Mm -hmm. And so that's how he started out and created um, uh, a, a pretty, um, uh, you know, a well, a well uh, financed uh, uh, film in this, uh, films. But what he would do, and what a, a, and this is also the way he sold his books, he would go to um, the black uh, house uh, theaters uh, throughout the the north and some part of the south, and he would say, "Okay, I got this film." He would show them either part of the story, or maybe he had a couple of scenes that he had already, you know, had already filmed, and he would show them that. Um, he might show them a poster. He used a lot of the, his feet, oh, all of his films, virtually all of his uh, films are um, a female. Uh, uh, the character, the main character is a female. Uh, his books are all about, mostly about male characters as a, as, as a, um, as a hero. Uh, and that has, has, that has a lot to do with the medium. Um, and he was unabashed. He would just, you know, go there and, and he would, or, or he would show a, um, uh, the film leaving out certain controversial parts because th there was a lot of censorship. He was not allowed to show within our gates in a lot of places. And so he would show the local uh, censor board, the uh, uh, doctored um, film with the certain scenes taken out. And then when they say, okay, we'll show it. And he put them back. Uh, just before he showed it, um, so he was always he he was he was always doing these kinds of you know anything he could do to uh, to to get money to make his films and he made about twenty two silent films. We only have three. Um, I I assume that from some of the titles, not all of them were very good. I mean, he was he did did do a lot of um, you know uh, very. Um, uh, exploitative kind of sort of, you know, uh, action films and kind of thing. When sound comes along, that's when you have, and that's in the late 20s, about 1929, 1930, um, uh, uh, synchronized sound comes into filmmaking. That's when filmmaking becomes very expensive and far more technically involved. And he couldn't compete in, and also after the depression, he went bankrupt during the depression, but lots of people did. Um, so that's when he started to um, get white money coming into, uh, um, into the making of his films. And then he started uh, making films that were, you know, musicals and so on and so forth. I actually, the 1930s is, is the period that I love to work on because this is also the period where because of the invasion of, of the American invasion of Haiti, um, you get, you know, you get the zombie films. Um, <laughs> and the, and the African-American zombie films are very interesting. And even the white uh, but sort of B or C film uh, versions of the zombie film are um, are very very interesting. But anyway, that, I digress. Uh, the, the point Carolyn, is, uh, yeah. I actually, um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit. You gave a little inkling of this the other day about your personal uh, relationship with this film when it was brought to this country. Um, after having been found in Spain and um, your experience of uh, sitting there in the Library of Congress. And you no, yeah. the no, no, but, you know, I actually saw it at the Library of Congress. I believe this was even before they had actually restored it and had put the, um, I believe they didn't have the English uh, title cards yet. Um, so, I mean, I was absolutely blown away by it. I, I, that's when I really started uh, working on the show because of that. Because of that. Uh, I mean, there I am alone, you know, the, the librarian put, I forget what the contraption they had me watch it on. Um, but um, 
I was there along with the film. Uh, and uh, it was just incredible because uh, at that time, they didn't release, I think that the final reconstruction was 1993 or somewhere around there. Um, and I don't remember when, when I saw it, but I, I believe it must have been before that. But it, 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 was, it, was, it, it was like opening a treasure chest you know, that had been hidden. Because and do, you, I mean, do you know yeah. why it was why it was hidden and why it ended up in Spain and what what is well, the story? Uh, you know the early period of film was like the period we're in now. People were just content crazy. They couldn't just get enough of films, and particularly um, uh, the films from the United States were interested. Um, uh, people in in Spain, it was it was in other countries, Denmark and so forth, and many other countries. The full extent of his um, penetration into Europe is is still ha still hasn't been investigated, as far as I know. Um, but they they wanted to know about Mer American life, American wars, um, uh, and so you know they just couldn't get enough of this stuff and particularly the the uh, um, the version that i saw in in this with the spanish subtitles it was obvious that they were very critical it was aimed at an audience that uh, was very critical of how um uh, americans handle race relations because that's what the i mean and the title of the film is in Spanish is La Negra, the black woman. Uh, the uh, within our gates would have had no no meaning in you know abroad, so they settled upon obviously the this the specific um, you know the the heroine in the in this in, in the film, but yeah, it was it was there to to um, you know show um, Europeans. Um, uh, the terrible state of, um, of American race relations. Not that, you know, it's th that the Spanish um, Caribbean was racist in its own ways, but not in, in the way that um, you know, they thought that Americans were. Um, Marilyn? Yeah. Um, I, I wonder, I, I have two things. One is, who made that comment about the documentary camera? Um, oh, um, I, I can I can send you uh, I can I can send you the, the the article. Well, send my apologies and corrections. It's something I I can't agree with. I mean, Flaherty made his documentaries within three or four years of this, and the word documentary wasn't even invented. Oh, I wasn't trying to to imply that what they were. I think what the what this particular critic and and this I, I said that this is not my my particular. I know critic. that Marilyn. I know. Yeah, yeah, but I, I'm just saying because it's, it's not my area. I'm saying that one of the things that they were looking at in terms of the way he does the framing is that he does keep the camera. Um, I think I, there's a possibility it may have to do with the camera he had. He may um, not have had the lenses for it. Um, I don't even know if he could pan with the camera that he had. So that would be a really interesting question is what kind of camera and what kind of lenses did he use? Uh, we it, have it, actually, I was gonna put it on, but I didn't. Uh, yeah. We do have one, pic one picture of him uh, with his camera person. Um, and it, it, is a, it is the kind of camera that you would have used on the field, in the field, not a studio camera, right. not that particular one. Right, yeah. Um, that was probably what he, uh, what he worked with and what he could afford. Yeah. I can send you the picture so you can see the, what the camera is. Much less uh, useful for the kind of shots that uh, we can do now, or even they could do four or five years later. Uh, I thought it, when I was watching it, I thought, my God, he achieved so much with a fixed camera. You know, a camera that can't move, a camera that can't pan, a camera without a close up lens. I just think he was incredibly inventive in the way he used a camera. Yeah. And the way uh, he got out of his actors a natural acting style 
that really delivered character. I just, I was uh, really astonished at how much he achieved without the theatrics that, you know, Griffith uses. No, very or even Flaherty for that matter. You know, I just, I, I, and of course the, the attempted rape scene, mm -hmm. that's an amazing set of shots. Yeah, that is, that is. And the, I, I, the I, temple I, of the cross crossing, of the cross cutting. Absolutely. Of yeah, that's I haven't what I edited, did. but you know. Given the camera that he was using, that's an amazing sequence. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I wanted to ask quickly is a little bit more about the distribution. I know the distribution in the South was different from the distribution in the North, but would any uh, white audiences, Bohemian audiences, I mean, Bohemian in the sense of, uh, you know, avant-garde and living outside the norm, would they have been watching this? Or was it all African-American audiences? Uh, this is mainly African-American audiences. It's not until his sound zones, because his sound zones had a lot of these musical numbers, like a lot of, uh, of, of, of films in, in the 30s there. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, he made films up until almost 1948, I think. Um, and these were mainly shown in African-American, uh, or uh, if they're not African-American theaters as such, that were in African American neighborhoods, um, right? And I, but it's unclear how far the district, uh, you know, the distribution went. Um, we, do, uh, I do not believe, um, and I haven't come across any um, uh, close analysis yeah. or investigation of that. It's possible that it. It could have been shown in smaller cities, um, but yeah, I, it's, I don't have any information. It's, it's an intriguing question for me, but I realize probably not much work has been done on it. Yeah. yeah. I, had, I, had one, I, had, I had one quick observation and one quick question. I'm going to start with the question first, which is, you know, in a lot of the um, takeaways, you know, like when they have the stills where the, you know, the language is given to us, the audience you know, between the, the moving, yeah, it's kind of weird. They, they have names, names framed there that don't particularly seem to be affiliated with the actual character who's speaking it. Is it the person, or, uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Well, I, I, I'm not sure uh, if, you, if you could give a specific instance, I'd be- uh, if, I, Well, it's, it's throughout the film, every, every time no. they go away, it's like uh, there's the, like the a problem. name and then there's language and it's like, but yes. that's, Characters not speaking that that yeah. language. Yeah, the problem is is that we do not have the original title cards. What okay. because what we have the the film is came with the Spanish titles and gotcha. there were only a couple of places where you could sort of see the English title below the Spanish gotcha. uh, title card. So you're so saying they, it's probably like a translation, it a, is a, translation a restoration kind of. And, and a restoration. A lot of it, for example, it isn't clear where he's, where in the title card that says that she was the legitimate child. That may not have been there. That may not have been the original because uh, there are newspaper accounts of the film at the time that say, that talk about her as an illegitimate child. <clears throat> the reason the legitimacy issue comes around, uh, comes about, is because of this racial uplift ideology that you couldn't have a the implication that uh, if you were, uh, uh, as she's called, it, racially mixed, that you're that either you're. Uh, one of your parents was a rapist or 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 there was uh or had been uh, a, a black woman who had been a prostitute or had given herself to a white man or had been raped or, or you know those things they nobody wanted to talk about those things so uh to say that she was legitimate even though it was possible but it was a very distant possibility since it was, you know, there were anti-miscegenation laws all over uh, during that period. Uh, and uh, 
So it, it would not have been very likely. And it appears that that was not in the original film. Uh, so we had to take those title cards uh, not, you know, I, I, I was just curious to the bigger audience. Was I the only one confused by these sort of like names? And then the language felt like it was spoke from the narrator who was actively on the screen, but the name didn't marry to them or, or was that just me? I'm just curious. If, I, I, I saw this a while ago, but it kind of wigged. Huh? I didn't notice it. I, I don't know what you're talking about. So I'd have to go back. and. <laughs> so, so nobody else. What was like I, almost on every like on uh, most title boxes you'd have like the dialogue and would say like Walter Williams and then it felt like it was the verbiage from the wealthy landowner or somebody else and it had nothing to do with it so it just felt disconnected and as I watched the movie I just started dismissing these um this name that was beforehand I, but maybe I, maybe I saw a different copy. I don't know, but it was no, just I, kind of I felt the same, Tom. I think okay, good, good. I, like I just want to make narrated. sure I'm not crazy. <laughs> no, I felt like it was being narrated, and then you'd see a different kind of action and, and, and emotion happening on the scene. So, like the title, the 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 language was setting it up or giving you something else, and then it, it cuts to some. That's how I felt. So I okay, Chevy, you are my, my new best friend. Because silent I was film. crazy for a second. <laughs> yeah. So. But my, my other, my other uh, uh, observation to you, uh, Marilyn, besides the fact I want to know what bridge that is behind you. Um. <laughs> Verisano, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's the background of, uh, in my apartment in New York City. <laughs> okay. Um, my other observation was it's really funny that you mention um, uh, Oscars films and then D.W. Griffith and the filmmaking style of the time um, because, you know, D.W. Griffith would go on to become sort of ignominious as sort of making um, uh, sort of racially intolerant films, of course, Birth of a Nation. Um, and, and so the, the sort of interesting fact I wanted to bring here, I'm a Boston guy. I live mm -hmm. in Boston. I'm a Hobart grad. Um, but um, uh, much of the film takes place in Boston of, of you know, inside our gates. Mm -hmm. And um, it was funny, I had the opportunity to read a book by the guy who did uh, the documentary about uh, the, the book about Black Mass um, with, with uh, Whitey Bulger, and it turned into the movie with Johnny mm -hmm. Depp. The guy who wrote that book did a book, I, I forget the title of the book, but there was this guy named Jermaine Trotter, who was an African American journalist in Boston. And he spent the he spent like ten years trying to ban Birth of a Nation from being played in Boston, um, and it's a really very interesting uh, uh, process of, uh, about you know in the early 1900s, even before the Great Migration, you know how how he tried to thwart this this race quote unquote racist film uh, mm -hmm. from being shown in the city of Boston where you know, the black population, African-American population was quite small to begin with. And he was the only African-American journalist. It's kind of a cool little book that yeah. uh, the guy who wrote um, Black Mass uh, did, if you're curious. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. That's a good reference. Yeah. A lot of places had to make the decision of whether they would show this, uh, of whether they would show Birth of the Nation, because um, uh, every town had its sort of its own control over what could be shown in the movie theater. Um, uh, and many times banned it. Uh, it was um, it, not so much because uh, of, yeah, the racial component, uh, but because they were afraid that it would bring the Klan to, to their, um, to their uh, towns and they didn't want the Klan marching in their towns because very often the birth of the, the, the the um, showing of, of Birth of a Nation was, um, was um, accompanied by uh, Klan um, demonstrations. Uh, they, um, but Michelle also ran into problems because within our gates, just like um, Do the Right Thing, the uh, towns were concerned that it would uh, create um, um, a riot uh, among African Americans. Um, so, as I mentioned before, one of his techniques of doing was to take out the the more controversial scenes, show it 
to the uh, whatever committee was in that town and then put put them back. <laughs> back to our but, but if you think about it, nobody was too concerned in the late sixties, early seventies, showing black exploitation films when actually the streets were on fire because of race riots, right? I mean, yeah, isn't that kind of uh, ironic. Uh, <laughs> right. No, and and uh, black exploitation films, of course, were essentially also exploitation of black actors and audiences by uh, major studios who would make these films that were uh, over the top violent because um, it would fit the stereotype um, of, of African Americans, and they were, you know, they they were also being exploited. There's a there's a very uh, interesting um, um, uh, uh, there, there's a a, a a YouTube channel devoted to um, uh, old African American uh, film, and um, they have the uh, uh, um, a, um, a documentary with Paul Mooney. I don't know if you know Paul Mooney. Um, oh yeah. Uh, and he talks about that there, and they have they have a very good. Um, I, I'm trying. I'll, I'll think of the name in a minute. You just gotta go see. My name is Dolomite. I mean, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Well, there were there. You know, there's a there's a lot of history behind that particular character as well. Marilyn, um, I think we have quite a time for one more question. If that's okay, okay if, you you. Have, if you have the energy, I will. Yeah. <laughs> So, <laughs> um, so this question is from Barbara Lupak, um, and she writes, since Michaud used the figure of the preacher, which he largely based on his own father-in-law so extensively in various, of his, in various films, um, could you comment further on his use of them, for example, in Body and Soul and The Exile? Well, um, Michel really had it in for preachers because he he had uh, worked very hard to get a farm, and um, and um, his he married a woman whose father was a preacher, and they uh, not only was it a disastrous marriage, uh, the father-in-law managed to uh, get. Um, get him out of his farm and sold it. Uh, and Michelle didn't see any of the money. So he certainly hated preachers from that moment on. You know, he was, uh, he was, um, uh, he didn't, he didn't have any, um, any uh, sort of balance when he went uh, about uh, showing um, preachers. And it, it was, it was very much his own, personal uh, experience, um, as well as he didn't believe in um, Christian salvation as such. He felt it was like an uh, opiate for uh, lower class African-Americans not to do as he was doing, which was uh, really working very hard and being entrepreneurial to get himself out of poverty. So. Uh, yeah, no, he he. That was, but if you have in, in nobody has, if you have not seen Body and Soul, the the uh, Paul Robeson performance. I mean, talk about acting. I I, says, I don't know how to talk about acting, but the acting in of Paul Robeson in that film is in, amazing um, because he plays the two characters, the good the good uh, man and the bad preacher, um, and. and you can see the talent. And that was his first film. It was the first film Paul Robeson had ever made. Well, this has just been fantastic, but believe it or not, it's getting on nine o'clock. So right. uh, we, we all better get to bed. Can right? I ask one quick question just before um, it was really more about the logistics of this talk, which I mean, to the administrator people. So the Smith Center is that place that's down I, I haven't been back to Hobart in so long, but the Smith Center is the place that Hobart has has its school concerts and stuff at that's down? Uh, not anymore. They we're very closely tied, the Smith and HWS, but in no official way. We have 
friendly partnerships and do programming together. Oh, no, no, I meant, but is it, it's on that cross street that comes down from Main Street, yep. right? That's the hall there? Yep. Okay. That's, I think I saw, I saw the band and a flock of seagulls in that hall. <laughs> not, not together separately, but uh, I just, awesome. I just wanted context. That's, yes, and, and yes. Steve Ray Vaughn. That's yeah, all. Big, I'm, I'm big, sorry. I, I just like jumped in there for that one little thing sorry i have this dv ray vaughn poster in my office so yeah uh, he opened for the band without robbie robertson and the weirdest thing about it just a hobart william smith thing i had literally just seen that film for the first time in lansing on a friday night literally like two weeks before i went and saw them down there i mean a long time ago but it, that was a lot of yeah this about this and that but uh, it's oh. like film to the smith center i mean i, I think it's a great connection yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, you know, this has been fantastic. I want to thank so much Teresa Gage and Chevy Devaney for um, pulling this all together. And um, yeah, and to our professors, uh, Professor Burdett and Professor Jimenez, um, this is, they already have given so much to the Smith, so much volunteer time, and it's so very much appreciated. Um, and um, I want to encourage all of you, if this wet your appetite, to go to the Finger Lakes Film Trail and to onto their website. They have four other early race films, fantastic pre-recorded introductions um, that are well worth, uh, you know, in, in experiencing both of them, the films as well as the commentary. And, um, and I know they'd love for you to reach out to them afterwards and, and tell them what you thought. And then please uh, stay connected with us at The Smith. We are continuing the virtual film club. And as I said at the top of today's program, we are gonna be in person very soon, which is incredibly exciting. Maybe one day we can take our masks off and give each other big hugs. But for now we can sit, you know, a few seats apart. The Smith is 1400 seats. So there's, there's really a, plenty of room for a hundred people to come and watch a film. Anyway, thank you so much within our gates. Oh, Catherine, did you have something final to say to, uh, let me, let, Catherine, you want to unmute yourself and you can. Yeah, yes, I, I actually just wanted to applaud uh, everyone for the, uh, for the uh, evening. It was great and uh, it's just great to be part of this community. I'm just looking forward to our next gathering. And I wanted to thank you all for coming. This was very invigor invigorating for me. Uh, I, uh, I really enjoyed uh, having you here and uh, being able to share with you. Thank you, Marilyn. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Have a great night. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Thank everyone. you.